G'day, and uh, welcome to the first day of 2018. Um, on the blog a few weeks ago, I said I was going to uh, write about how I laid hand laid tracks, so I thought rather than write it out, I might try doing a couple of videos because, um, um, well, I suppose I wanted to uh, make it easier for myself in some ways. But also I wanted to make it clearer and uh, it takes a lot of time and thought and effort to write it and photograph it in a way that will be self-explanatory or easily explained. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a point and, uh, or a switch and I'm going to do that over about two or three or four episodes of sh short videos. Well hopefully they'll be short. Um, so this morning I'm sitting in my layout room uh, in my uh, shed and I'm sitting in front of the area where I'm going to lay the point. Um, it's on Queen's Wharf. Queen's Wharf is the section of the layout I'm sitting in front of and um, what I'm going to do is um, go through step by step right from the track base or the, the, the I suppose the, the, um, the, the base of the, of the point right through to uh, laying the sleepers, um, pinning the rail, preparing the rail and then pinning it and then installing the layout. So that's going to be a fairly long process. So with any luck, we can um, get through that in a clear manner, and this will be the start of that. Okay, so this is the part of the layout of Queen's Wharf that um, where the where the point's going to sit. The reason there's a point, this point here, the reason there's a point already sitting here is because several years ago I made a switch for this section of layout that was going to become my permanent home layout, and then due to a career change, I had to move and sell the house. I didn't have to sell the house, but I just chose to sell the house. When I was going to reinstall this section of um, track, I thought, well, I've got that point, I'll use it in this, in this yard, leading off to a couple of industrial uh, sidings. And when I looked at it, I thought, mm, that'll work. And I sat it there for a while and I made the track that you can see in the background here and uh, laid that last, over the last few days. But when I took a closer look at this, I realised that this piece of rail, these rail, this rail here, is code 100, and the point is made from code 125. Now, while that wouldn't have been a major issue, like a lot of modellers, I like to um, keep my <coughs> sidings, if I can, to a slightly lighter rail, and my plan was to lay code 100 rail through here. Now, I have space for this point further down the layout, to allow me to run it to a little mill building I'm going to make as another model. So I thought if I use that on the, on the main line with code 125, I can remake or make another point for, with using code 100. That's hence the reason for, the, for this video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start by showing you how I make these points right from the start. I make my points on pieces of thin ply. In this case, it's, it's uh, four millimeters thick which I assume is around about, probably around about a quarter of an inch thick, maybe a little bit less. The sleepers, or the ties, are made of wood from uh, Kapler, um, from Kapler in the US, um, and they're supplied by a company called, uh, in Australia, called um, Guida Valley Models. I get my sleeper material, both my standard sleepers that you can see in this track over here, and the longest material, which is cut to the same dimensions, just in long lengths, uh, two foot or 600 millimetre lengths, I get that all from um, Guida Valley Models. What I'll do now is I'll take this point and I'm planning to turn the, the base of this point into, a, um, into two, uh, I suppose, blanks made from ply. One will form the basis of a, um, I suppose, a jig or a, um, a, a drawing pattern so I can make more points later from the same piece of material and one will form the base of the point that's going to go in this spot. Okay, I'm downstairs in my workshop where I do most of my uh, dusty cutting and uh, woodwork. What I've done is I've taken this point, uh, which will be used in another spot in the layout, and I've used it as a, I suppose, as a pattern to draw around um, two spots on a piece of four millimetre ply that I have sitting in the workshop. This uh, stuff, this ply is from, I bought it at Bunnings, it's a small panel, probably I think 600 mil, possibly by 1.2 or 900 mil by uh, 600 mil, something like that. Um, but it's four millimeters thick, 
and they call it project panels. Now, it's quite expensive to buy it that way compared to buying a big sheet, but I haven't got a trailer that will allow me to um, transport a big sheet, so I tend to use these smaller panels because it's more convenient. What I've done is I've, I've drawn two of the patterns around this, this base, uh, which I'll use as, um, one is, a, is going to be a drawing pattern I'm going to keep and not use to make a point on, the other one's going to form the basis of that point. I'll cut it out and I'll come back later. The one thing I didn't mention before I started cutting was that um, I'm cutting this out with a, just a standard hand jigsaw. Um, to me it's fairly obvious that you'd use a jigsaw for this sort of work, but possibly to other people who aren't quite as experienced at this stuff as me, um, it's not that obvious. What I'm doing basically is just running around the, the, uh, the pencil lines with the jigsaw in a fairly rough manner. I'm not too worried about staying exactly on the line or inside or outside the line. There's a bit of give in these, in these templates and um, I'm, not, I'm not taking a great deal of uh, notice of the lines hugely. But what I am doing is I'm making sure that I, um, I get it cut out reasonably closely to the line and I'll dress up the edges with, the, um, with other tools for instance, a, um, a mitre saw to cut the ends off and uh, probably a, a small plane, hand plane or something like that to cut, uh, to I suppose smooth and, and round over the edges because I want the, the edges of this timber to um, mirror the shape of, a, um, of the ballast line when I lay the ballast on the point there. Okay. Okay, so I now have both the um, plywood bases for the, for the two, um, I suppose, jobs I'm going to use these for. One is the point uh, that I'm going to lay with rail and sleepers on top of the furthest one near the edge of the table there. And the one that's a bit closer that has a slightly, is a slightly shorter is going to form the cutting template. Now with this uh, longer one, I'm, going to, I'm cleaning the edge up with a small plane. Um, not so much because I couldn't do it with uh, other things, a rasp or a, um, a piece of even rough sandpaper or something, but a plane, it, this plane is nice and sharp and I um, know how I'm using it, so I'm just using it to just slightly, ever so slightly round over the edge. I'm taking off less than, a lot less than a millimetre with each swipe, just to give me a little bit of, um, of a round over the edge, and on this other side, I just do the same thing. Now, of course, with this one, as this is going to be a drawing template, I'm not going to do the, uh, the round over because um, I want a straight, smooth edge or a clean, smooth edge. What I'll do is I'll clean this up with sandpaper and um, I'll write template on it with a texture of some sort and that will be used then as uh, a drawing template if I want to make some more points later. The other thing about this, of course, is that um, uh, it can be a left or a right hand point simply by turning it over. Okay. Here we have the three, I suppose, different um, rolls for these bases. There's the point on the right hand side made from code 125 rail. There's the new track base I'm going to make a code 100 rail point on and this is the drawing template I'm going to use later. I've been telling myself for years I was going to write, use one of these bases as a drawing template because once you've laid these on the track, <coughs> sorry, on your layout and put ballast over it, it's a bit difficult to use it as a drawing template. <coughs> Excuse me. So this will be set aside somewhere and as you can see I've written drawing template written on it uh, and it's a number six point. One of the things I didn't mention as to why I'm using four millimeter, pl uh, four millimeter plywood for my um, point bases. Well um, for me there's nothing worse than, than the neck you get from um, uh, spiking rail over a layout. Um, Almost nowhere on the layout is it ideal to spike rail, so I build my points and my track, both curved and straight, on pieces of plywood. 4mm plywood is about the thinnest plywood you can get at the local hardware store. You can get 3mm as well, but 4mm is about the thinnest you can get before you start getting into specialist or really thin, narrow, you know, really thin um, specialist types of plywood that costs an absolute fortune. This stuff is readily available, fairly cheap, reasonably consistent. I don't use MDF because MDF will swell and it will ruin your um, track work. So points are made by me a bit like set track points. I make them up on these blanks. I do it inside in the comfort of either a heated or a cooled room 
Um, I do it over a workbench, and while my neck still gets sore from bending over it, nowhere near as bad as it would be as if I was leaning over my layout. So what I'm going to do now is take this inside into my workroom. I'm going to lay a paper template, which you can see on the other point, over the top of it, and then I'm going to start cutting up the sleepers to lay on it. Okay, I've got most of my track laying materials in front of me, and these are things I tend to use mostly as, a, um, as I build a piece of plane track, curved or straight, or um, points. The two types of sleeper timbers I use are these sleepers, standard length 9 foot sleepers, uh, which are a special item, a um, capital item that um, Guida Valley Models gets made up, especially for 7mm model, model, modellers. They're not standard items that you can just buy in, off the website from Kapler, so you need to go to uh, Guida Valley Models. And they're especially cut to be the right length and thickness width for a, um, a New South Wales sleeper, but they're also thicker than, than the real thing because they are made to match in height a Pico point or Pico track. Um, the sleepering material is this stuff here, exactly the same dimensions as these smaller ones, but in two foot or 22 inch long pieces, so they're not quite 600 millimetres. When I make a normal point, um, uh, from scratch, out of code 125, I will use a fast tracks jig, which is a number six, which matches the point, and uh, this one is for code 70 to code 100. But if I'm making out of code 125, I will tend to uh, obviously I will use a code 125 um, uh, jig for filing up the point frogs. But because I am making out of code 100, I actually have some of these little cast brass frogs that I made the um, pattern for, for um, uh, well originally for um, uh, Waratah Models whose range is now owned by Modelo Kits. Now I'm not sure what these retail for but when I made the pattern for these I got a, a few of them, I've got about seven or eight of them here. I got an original version, this is a much longer version which cost a lot more to cast so we made a smaller version. And for the first time ever, I'm actually going to try making a point using one of these. And um, we're going to see how it goes. What it will do is it will allow me not to have to file up the um, frog from um, a rail because I've already got the cast version here. Okay, now we're getting really serious. These um, pieces of paper are a printout of a template that um, a number six for a number six point that Kieran Ryan drew a uh, very great many years ago, which I tend to use as a standard size point for my layouts, and which I found to be more than adequate for um, laying out a point. Now, of course, if I ever want to lay out a number eight or a number seven point, I'm sort of stuck because I haven't got a template for that. But a number six I find is more than um, meets my needs, and um, these paper templates are cheap. In other words, they're the cost of a piece of paper and a bit of printer toner. And I've got them on my computer. I can size them up or size them, adjust their size if they're a little bit narrow or something, because they don't. Sometimes the computer compresses it and printing it out. But um, by printing these out, and there's about 32 millimeters between the rails, but to be honest, even if there isn't 32 millimeters exactly between the rails, if it's a little bit less or a little bit more, I mainly use these for laying out the, the sleepers. So what I'll do is I'll stick them to the template, cut the point timbers up, and stain them, and then glue them literally to this paper template. I'll cut around this before I lay them in, and I line it all up using the centre line which is marked on the template. I'll draw a centre line on this on this template here. This is a, number, a left hand point, and then I will basically just um, glue it onto the surface, stick the uh, the prepared sleepers onto that and then lay the track across the top of it, so the rail across the top of it, so it's as simple as that. Okay, I've uh, cut the templates up, or the, uh, the paper templates up, and drawn a single centre line down the middle of the applied base, and these will be lined up using that centre line after I glue them, and they'll basically form a template for me to lay 
the sleepers on the ply. They're not really used for much else. I don't use them to uh, lay the rail or take a lot of notice of where things are located on the template because basically once you set the straight stock rail in, everything else comes off that. So even if a fixture said to you to put, it, put something in a particular place, I would tend to work off the basis of that rail rather than what's on the template, which is why I don't bother buying any of the um, uh, various laying templates or um, uh, sleeper laying or point laying templates that I've seen for sale over the years because once I've set that stock rail, I've prepared it, pinned it in place, everything else works from that rail. sleepers so I'm using a fair bit of it. It's 
for many years I used um, India ink and uh, isopropyl alcohol. Um, the mix, I used the uh, isocol stuff that's available in a green bottle in, um, in supermarkets. Um, I'm going to look around and see if I can find a cheaper source of that stuff. I'm sure there's, a, there's, a, there's probably a big container of it available somewhere at, um, at a hardware store that for, for uh, you know 10% of the price. But at the moment what I'm using is this wattle stain, which is basically just um, black. And I, I stopped using the India ink because first of all it was extremely expensive and it just wasn't as good as it used to be. Um, I was using Windsor, um, Newton Windsor or some brand from the UK. It was costing me $30 for a tiny little bottle and um, uh, it wasn't producing the results. I love the results from the India ink I used to get. Um, the, the stain when it got into the wood would be um, a beautiful mix of different colours. It's sort of browns and um, tans and different colours. This, this stuff is uniformly black and it's very blue. It's got a, quite a bit of blue in it. So um, the, the, the colours that come out of it are quite a bit darker and a little bit more, uh, I suppose, a little bit harsher under the light so I run the layer under. But generally speaking, um, it, it, it produces a good result and it's a, it's a tenth the cost of the India ink. So I'm, I've, uh, I've let cost drive the, drive the process. So all I really need to do is stain the timber. Now, it's nothing scientific or very hard to do. You get the timbers like that, stick them in there like that. I've got a pair of uh, tweezers here. Swish them around. And basically, all this is, you can see I've used this, this uh, paper towel for stains. I keep um, a layer of paper, newspaper. I have to go out and buy a newspaper especially to do this because I don't buy a paper anymore. I read my paper online. And I basically leave it in there for maybe about 30 seconds and then I start just getting it out. I drain off the excess and just line them up like that. They don't need any longer than that. As a matter of fact, you, you could leave them in overnight and I don't think the stain would get any further into the wood. Um, it very readily takes up the stain and the alcohol mix. And, um, uh, and if you were to ask me what the, the, the proportions of the mix are, I couldn't tell you. I put a bit of um, uh, stain, I put a bit of alcohol in the base. I put a bit of stain in there, I put the alcohol in, I spray it in, and I test a bit of wood, and when I like the look, I use that. And then when I want to top it up, I just add a bit. It's a bit like the magic pudding, it never runs out. And that's it. There's nothing scientific and nothing terribly special about this. It's just basically dump them in and take them straight out. So, we are now up to the point of gluing the sleepers to the point template. What I did was I laid out all the sleepers just to just to get their different sizes. Turn, uh, I had one spare one for some reason, and uh, it was too short and it was a it was too long for where it was supposed to be. And um, I cut it down so it's sitting over here somewhere. Um, but generally speaking, um, it, things turned out fine. Just like a lot of this, it's repetitive but fairly simple work. A little bit of PVA, which is just wood glue, and don't take any notice of the cover of this. It's, it's um, I get my wood glue in a big tub that I stick in bottles, and I've had that bottle probably for well, way too many years. Um, put a bit of glue on a on a um, scrap of styrene. I use toothpicks or cocktail sticks or whatever you want to call them. Um, I like the double-ended ones that come in a little red packet like this. Come in a little red packet like that, get them at a supermarket, and stick them in a film container. Boy, that's getting out of date. Um, and I'll just basically make very simple work of this. Scrape along the back of the thing with some glue, stick it on the point template, and just use the center line to line it up. Simple as that. Now, once I get to the longer, to the longer sleepers at the end here, of course, there's no center line on those. I'll just use I'll do that by eye, but um, because I know these are centered, I know they'll line up with the track that will come in from this side. Okay, um, really, that's all I can say at the moment. I mean, I'll take each one as I go, and it will take me about probably 30 minutes, 20 or 30 minutes to glue all these sleepers down. All right, it's um, taken me about 30 minutes to glue the sleepers to the track base, and I've brought the other um, point in. To, um, to illustrate a couple of things and to, I suppose, just to talk a, uh, a little bit about some of the choices I make over the, 
over the time. I've been outside to the shed in my workshop and um, drilled an 8mm hole between the uh, sleepers that uh, uh, will form where the, where the I suppose the uh, tie bars will sit. There's two tie bars I make from PCB sleepers and a bit of bent brass and they sit um, between the two long sleepers here and the next one ahead. I'm just going to clean up the mess left by bits of excess paper and wood by drilling that hole but of course this is where the um, piano wire or whatever you want to call it a piece of steel wire will come through um, from the switch machine. Now the switch machine I'll use is a tortoise um, and it will come through and sit in a little brass piece of brass tube I'll sold it to the PCB sleeper but I'll show you how to do that in the next episode or the next instalment of this series if you want to call it a series. Um, I'm almost at the end of this of this section. Um, I I put a lot, lot of sort of suppose time into this base almost as much as it will take me to make the um, lay all the track. It takes a, a, a little bit of time to just get the base ready and make sure it's everything's where you want it. Um, and, you, and you can ease the construction um, a little bit by um, doing things ahead of time. Once all the, the point, uh, sorry, once all the rail and the, um, the switch bars and the tie bars are in, it's a little bit difficult to take account of the fact that uh, I, I don't put any um, ballast in these um, in between the points here. Um, I find the ballast just gets in the way. It just uh, makes a mess and it um, uh, just gets in the way of everything. And because of that reason, I want there to be a sort of a, a neutral colour because there's no ballast going to cover everything up. And I suppose if I was really careful, I could I could put ballast in there. But um, because I don't want to um, interfere with anything, I just leave that all ballast free. I'll put ballast up to about there and into about there and to there. But in terms of between the rails, I don't put ballast anywhere near that. So what I do is I just get a little bit of neutral um, coloured paint and just top, just paint in between that. I don't know what that colour is. It's some sort of greenish tinge stuff. Probably Tamiya. This is a Tamiya colour. I think it's just called Flat Earth or Earth, is it? Oh, it's written on the bottle. Flat Earth. I'm running a bit short of this one. I'm hoping... Uh, that I'm going to be able to use this colour as a replacement for my dwindling supply of Flocal uh, Rail Brown, which is one of my favourite colours. And um, I've got a feeling that after this set of uh, track laying, I'm not going to have much left of it, so I'm going to need something to replace it. It's a little bit um, browner than the Rail Brown. It's got a little bit of green at Rail Brown, and, and, te and testers don't seem to have made a, an acrylic replacement for the um, Flocal colour yet, so um, not that I can find anyway. So I'm using this stuff as a, as a bit of a test. I may paint some of the rail at some point with this uh, Flat Earth, which is still available, readily available in shops, but I'm going to see. All right, so with the hole dr drilled and the um, and the base painted, I can say that I'm essentially finished preparing the track base. Um, I made a little sample there. Um, I've been cleaning up the um, the point frog, and I need to do a little bit of uh, filing of that and that. But that's really the next instalment 